let's look at this 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 week's questions. Question one, how would you describe Mrs Smith? What do you think Anne admires so much in her? Hmm, looks like my dog wants to join the discussion. Uh, so. Mrs Smith. Remember, this is the poor commoner friend. Uh, that Anne goes to visit in the village once in a while. And uh, I think we can describe her as uh, unlucky, but still of good character, right? We know that she's poor, uh, that uh, she has been through some unlucky things in her life, which is why she is currently poor. She's also disabled. She can't move around a lot without pain. Um, and yet every time Anne visits her, she seems uh, to be maybe not happy, but at least not in a complaining state of mind. She's content. She tries to find happiness in her life. I think that's what we can say. Um, and I think this is probably why Anne admires her so much. Hang on, I forgot to hit record. Sorry about that. Oh, I did. Oh, thank you. I didn't know you could do that. OK, yeah. so. Um, I think that's maybe what Anne admires her, uh, why Anne admires her so much that um, unlike the people in her own family for whom social circumstances are the most important thing um, for Mrs. Smith, her circumstances are terrible, but um, she still manages to find happiness in her life wherever she can. Um, so maybe that's why. OK, question two, Mrs. Smith argues for the value of what some call gossip. Do you agree? Why or why not? Let's take a look at this. Uh, let's see. OK, so here uh, Mrs Smith is talking about. Um, I believe this is Colonel Wallace's nurse. Uh, I believe. Uh, she shares and she has her own nurse. Um, and. Hang on, no, she I think she shares a nurse with Colonel Wallace, is that right? And Colonel Wallace is, of course, Mrs. Uh, Mr. Smith's, Mr. Elliot's friend. Um, so here she's talking about how their shared nurse passes along gossip. Um, let's see. Everybody's heart is open, you know, when they have recently escaped from severe pain or are recovering the blessing of health. And Nurse Rook thoroughly understands when to speak. She is a shrewd, intelligent, sensible woman. Hers is a line for seeing human nature. And she has a fund of good sense and observation, which as a companion make her infinitely superior to thousands of those who have only received the best education in the world. No, nothing worth attending to. So here she's saying that Nurse Rook uh, because she has seen so much pain and death, uh, knows more of human nature and is a better companion than people who only, uh, this refers to uh, go to good schools and have good book learning education. Uh, Mrs. Smith continues, call it gossip if you will, but when Nurse Rook has half an hour's leisure to bestow on me, she is sure to have something to relate that is entertaining and profitable. Uh, so profitable means uh, meaningful. It can give you something. Something that makes one know one species better. Uh, so saying that Nurse Rook's 
so-called gossip is full of stories of human nature. Um, and Anne says, I can easily believe it. Women of that class, lower class, have great opportunities, and if they are intelligent, may be well worth listening to. Such varieties of human nature as they are in the habit of witnessing, which means they often see. And it is not merely in its follies that they are well read, for they see it occasionally under every circumstance that can be most interesting or affecting. So it's not just when we talk about human nature, often we only talk about the silly stuff, the stupid stuff, or the embarrassing stuff. Um, but here Anne is saying they also see people in every circumstance that can be interesting or affecting. Affecting means emotionally moving. What instances, which means cases or examples, must pass before them of ardent, which means passionate, disinterested, which means not related to themselves, self-denying attachment of heroism. Attachment here, of course, means a uh, uh, accompaniment, um, emotional attachment that is not for oneself. It's self-denying of heroism, fortitude, which means strength, patience, resignation, which means like they accept the situation. Of all the conflicts and all the sacrifices that ennoble us most, so that make us noble people. Remember last week we talked about Anne's recommended prose reading uh, that uh, Captain Benwick should read um, things, uh, memoirs of, of suffering and endurance, uh, because apparently it's suffering that uh, makes some, a life worth reading about. So this is the same sacrifices that ennoble us the most. A sick chamber may often furnish the worth of volumes. Furnish means provide. So one person taking care of a sick, uh, some sick patients can give us the same value as many books, volumes and volumes of books. Um, and Mrs. Smith uh, adds some qualifications or conditions. Generally speaking, it is weakness and not strength that appears in a sick chamber. It is selfishness and impatience rather than generosity and fortitude. There is so little real friendship in the world. Um, so back to the question, the value of what Mrs. Smith says some people call gossip seems to be in how uh, it reveals people's nature or their uh, fundamental belief, or also how they are willing to struggle and fight uh, and sacrifice for other people. Um, so this ties into the idea of a good morality being uh, people willing to suffer for something that is worth suffering for. Uh, so even though she later adds that a lot of this, most of this gossip is about weakness and impatience rather than the good parts. But still, this is also part of uh, human nature. Uh, and so that gives this gossip value. And Anne agrees. Uh, do you agree? Mm. I mean, yeah, sure. This kind of gossip, yes, I believe. Um, but today, when we talk about gossip, we often talk about, oh, this person did that to this other person. Uh, that kind I don't think is very healthy. Um, you know, rumors and like accusations without proof. Uh, if that kind of gossip has any value, the value should probably be in helping us uh, to train our critical thinking and independent thinking. But the kind of like, what um, Mrs. Smith is calling gossip today, we would call the anecdote, 短故事, 小故事, the short story of something that happened to someone. Those can be very valuable. 
Uh, let me let me spell that for you. Anecdote. OK, next question. Do you think Anne's criticism of Mr. Elliot makes sense? Why or why not? Uh, so I'll let you think about this for about 20 seconds as I let my dog in through the door. So what are Anne's criticisms of Mr. Elliot? Um, 106, 107. Here. Mr. Elliot was rational, discreet, which means uh, careful about privacy, polished, uh, to polish is to cha liang, so which means his own person is very prepared well presented, but he was not open. There was never any burst of feeling. Any warmth of indignation kai, or delight at the evil or good of others. This to Anne was a decided imperfection. Decided here means definite. It is a definite imperfection. Her early impressions were incurable. Uh, incurable here means unchangeable or hard to change. She prized the frank, uh, which means honest, the open hearted, the eager character beyond all others. Uh, warmth and enthusiasm did captivate her still. She felt that she could so much more depend upon the sincerity of those who sometimes looked or said a careless or a hasty thing than of those whose presence of mind never varied, whose tongue never slipped. So presence of mind. Remember last week we were talking about people losing their heads. If you don't lose your head, then you have a presence of mind. Your mind is still present. It's still here. Uh, and of course, to say something wrong is to have a slip of the tongue. So here Anne is saying she prefers people who are honest and sincere, and maybe they say something wrong once in a while. But Anne thinks that these people are better than those who never do anything wrong and are always very careful. Mr. Elliot was too generally agreeable. Various as were the tempers in her father's house, temper here means pishing. He pleased them all. He could make everybody happy. He endured too well, stood too well with everybody. He had spoken to her with some degree of openness of Mrs. Clay had appeared completely to see what Mrs. Clay was about and to hold her in contempt. And yet Mrs. Clay found him as agreeable as anybody. So here Anne gives the example. Uh, last time Mr. Elliot talked with her about Mrs. Clay, he agreed with her that Mrs. Clay is probably not the best person. Maybe Mrs. Clay has some plans to try to seduce Sir Walter or someone else. And yet, uh, so Mr. Elliot agrees with Anne, holds Mrs. Clay in contempt. And yet, Mrs. Clay could still like him. Uh, in other words, Mr. Elliot is still making himself agreeable and likable to Mrs. Clay, this person that he thinks or that he says he thinks is a bad person. Um, so Anne's criticism of Mr. Elliot is that he is too polished, too put together. In other words, too perfect. Do you think that makes sense? I think it does. Um, 
nobody really is perfect. I think we can agree on that. So if someone looks perfect, and when I say perfect, I don't just mean perfect for one person. Like maybe in the future when you get married, you might think that your spouse is perfect. I mean perfect as in everybody thinks they're perfect. Nobody is really like that. So if someone presents themselves as if they were perfect to everyone, that must be a conscious effort. They are they present themselves as perfect because they are trying to be perfect to everyone. So of course the next question is why are they trying so hard to be perfect to everyone? Um, for most of us, um, most of the time if we show some emotion or if we say something that's maybe not entirely polite, uh, I think we all understand that people are human and they make small mistakes and it's no big deal. So why would someone think that it is a big deal uh, to not make any mistakes at all, to make sure that everyone likes them? Maybe Mr. Elliot has something to hide. And we will see that whether he does or does not have something to hide. Uh, I think next week in the last four chapters. Um, so. Yeah, that's the question. So uh, her criticism of Mr. Elliot is he's too careful to be perfect. Something's wrong with this guy. Uh, or another way to look at this. Since we're not having a discussion, I can only talk with myself. Another way to look at this is uh, everyone has a set of morals, a, a sense of what is right and what is wrong, a sense of who are the better people and who are the worst people. If, uh, for example, if Mr. Elliot tries to be perfect to everyone he meets, including the worst people, including the people with uh, bad morals that do things that he does not agree with. That kind of means that he doesn't really care about right or wrong, that his own morals are, uh, I guess we could call them flexible. You, they can change depending on the situation. And if your sense of right and wrong can change depending on the situation, are they really right and wrong? Do you, does Mr. Elliot in that sense actually have uh, a strong sense of morality? If he can agree with Anne that Mrs. Clay is a bad person and yet still try his best to be perfect to Mrs. Clay as well. Um, I'm, I'm using questions because I don't think there is a correct answer to this. Uh, on the one hand, Yes, if you are consistent in your morality, uh, you should not try to please people that you think are bad people. On the other hand, we live in a society with other people. No man is an island, and sometimes you will find yourself working with or cooperating with people that you just really hate, even people that you think are terrible people. In that sense, uh, in order to get things done, you would still have to uh, hold your moral judgment inside and not uh, present it all the time. But even in those cases, I don't think you would try to be perfectly agreeable to such a bad person. You would only aim for the minimum of being able to work together. Trying to appear perfect to someone that you don't agree with at all morally does seem to be a moral weakness. Either this person is very insecure. Or as we were just saying, this person has something to hide. Uh, there's some part of their true person that they don't want to present to the world to anyone. And from what we know, Mr. Elliot does not seem to be the insecure kind of person. 
Uh, OK. Well, also, like if he really was insecure, I don't think he would be able to present such a perfect image of himself to everyone all the time. Right? Insecure people uh, by nature find it very hard to always be the right thing to the right people all the time. And yet Mr. Elliot seems to be doing a fine job. Um, so all the evidence so far suggests that he has something to hide, and that's why um, he is so good and so perfect to everybody. Next question. Uh, question four. Anne believes that Louisa's fall will affect almost every aspect of her life. Do you agree? Why or why not? OK, page 111. Uh, OK, so. This is after Anne learns that uh, Captain Benwick and Louisa are going to be married. Uh, Louisa had fine naval fervor, which means passion to begin with, and they would soon grow more alike. He would gain cheerfulness and she would learn to be an enthusiast for Scott and Lord Byron. Remember these two famous poets. Nay, that was probably learnt already. Of course they had fallen in love over poetry. The idea of Louisa Musgrove turned into a person of literary taste and sentimental reflection. So uh, like nostalgic or emotional reflection was amusing, but she had no doubt of its being so. The day at Lyme, the fall from the cob might influence her health, her nerves, which means her mental state, her courage, her character to the end of her life as thoroughly as it appeared to have influenced her fate. Um, OK, so there are a number th of things to, to talk about in this paragraph. First, they would grow more and more alike. Um, do you think that's generally true for couples? The longer they stay together, the more and more alike they become. Mm, I think it's possible. Uh, but the, an even more general situation, even more likely situation is that they grow more and more understanding of each other. That they maybe when they first get together, there are still some points of disagreement or things that they they see in different ways or have different values. Uh, maybe the longer they're together, the closer they'll grow and the more similar their ideas and values will become. Maybe, maybe not, but I think it's pretty likely that the more they are together, the longer they are together, the more they will be able to understand the other person's values and points of view. Even if they don't agree, they at least will understand what the other person is talking about. Uh, but here Anne seems to think that they will grow more alike. He would grow cheerful. Now remember he was sad because his fiance Fanny Harville had died. So you could say that well, um, he will grow cheerful not as a change in personality, but simply because his sadness will start to recede into the background. It will no longer be the main part of his life. So he will naturally cheer up a bit. As for Louisa, she will be an enthusiast for this poetry. Um, in fact, probably already was. And this is also interesting to think about. Why does Anne think that Louisa has already been converted into a person of literary taste? Well, 
we know that Louisa previously liked to go out and have fun, but now that she has been injured, she has to stay in bed or at least in the Harville household most of the day. And yet she is still a person that is full of energy. So if she can't spend that energy on physical activities, then she can only spend those energies on mental activities. The first one, of course, is conversation. Benwick is also there. He's also not exactly family anymore. He's like former family. He almost got married to Fanny Harville. Right now, he's just a good friend of the fam of the Harville family. Um, so these two people are sort of one is mourning, the other is injured. Nobody really l likes to be around Benwick because he's so sad. And nobody really likes to be around Louisa because whenever they see Louisa lying in bed, they feel pity and, and sad about Louisa's accident. So these two people are isolated uh, from their social circle at the Harville house. So I think it's pretty natural that they would start talking to each other. And because Benwick loves to read, they would probably talk about poetry. And uh, Louisa might be influenced. So. Uh, and so Anne is thinking, well, maybe this is what brings them together. Uh, Louisa's energies are now spent on poetry and reading and appreciating poetry. And if these two share a passion for poetry, this passion is a very strong kind of emotion. And if you do something very emotional with someone else, you form an emotional bond with that person. This is why so many guys like to take girls to watch horror movies, because feeling scared is also a strong emotion. Um, so. This is one way that Louisa's fall has affected her uh, as uh, Anne thinks of it. It has influence. Sorry, it has. Influenced Louisa's fate. Fate here meaning like who she's going to marry, what the rest of her life will life will look like. Um, but it has also influenced some other things, right? Her health. She probably uh, will still feel some effects of the fall throughout her life. Her nerves, her mental state. Maybe she will be less uh, careless in her physical activities. No longer running around uh, without thinking about safety. Her courage, same thing. Maybe she will not be as courageous, or maybe she will be even more courageous. It's hard to tell because uh, if she may think, if I can recover from this such a serious accident, I can recover from anything. So that's one also a possibility. And her character. If her health and her nerves and her courage are influenced, then these three add up to a different kind of character or personality. So a single fall not only changes Louisa's fate, it also changes Louisa's personality. And these things do seem to uh, be. Uh, they do. They do seem like they will affect her for the rest of her life. Uh, question five. First of all, what time is it? Ah, oh, we have lots of time. We're going really fast today. Uh, do you have questions so far? Can you slow down a little bit? Nope. <laughs> Ah, OK, I'll Thank try you. to slow down. Um, are there parts of the lecture that you want me to go over again? Oh, it's OK. I can check the video of what is like since I need to take the note, so uh, just slow down a little bit. Thank OK, you. sure, sure, sure. OK, question five. 
Anne believes that Captain Wentworth must still love her. Do you agree? Why or why not? Can you give evidence? Well, uh, remember, I think it was the first week or the second week when we read about how Captain Wentworth uh, rescued Anne from the young child, Walter. Uh, before that, like uh, the first week when Anne says that she believes she no, she no longer has power over Captain Wentworth. Because Captain Wentworth seems to be ignoring her or like not being polite around her. We were saying that is evidence that he still cares about her. Um, so at the time, the reader could understand that, but Anne did not see it. Finally here, Anne does have a hint that maybe Captain Wentworth still uh, loves her. Let's see, where is this? Uh, there we go, he must love her. So why? What is, why? Uh, Let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, let's let's look at this part. No, 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 it's a bit earlier. So the, here they're at the concert. Um, where is it? Jeez. We were right there. I'm looking at this. looking at Is she talking to Wentworth? No. Distant bow. Uh, Conversation. I think she's talking to Mr. Elliot, right? Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, she's talking to Wentworth. Mm, OK, so they're talking. Um, I think somewhere in here. Uh, he says that he's that he didn't really want to marry Louisa. Uh, OK, so starting here. So now Anne and Wentworth are talking about uh, Louisa's impending marriage to Benwick. Uh, and they're talking about the family's reaction, right? So when uh, Can I on the page, this is page 121. So the Musgroves this is Wentworth, he's talking. The Musgroves are behaving like themselves most honorably and kindly, only anxious with true parental hearts to promote their daughter's comfort. All this is much, very much in favor of their happiness, which means it looks like uh, with such supportive family, they will have a happy marriage. Now, Politeness says that Wentworth could stop here. You know, oh, it looks like they'll have a happy marriage. That's a very polite thing to say. But he continues, more than perhaps. So in his mind, he is comparing something. Now, we know that he doesn't, he didn't really want to marry Louisa. So he's not thinking about the possibility of his marriage with Louisa. If we're talking about marriage and family support, the other big fat example is, of course, Wentworth's uh, engagement with Anne nine years ago. Right in this marriage between Benwick and Louisa, the families are both supportive. The Harville family and the Musgrove family both support the marriage. This is much better, much more than 
uh, nine years ago when Wentworth wanted to marry Anne and the Elliots and Lady Russell all opposed the marriage. So this is what he's thinking. And that's why he stops, because this would be terribly impolite to say. A sudden recollection seemed to occur. And to give him some taste of that emotion which was reddening Anne's cheeks and fixing her eyes on the ground. So uh, she also remembers when he says more than she is also thinking of the same thing, their past engagement. So her face is reddening. Uh, her eye, he, she can't look at him. She's feeling embarrassed. And uh, so when Wentworth realizes what he's saying, and then looks at Anne, he also realizes uh, this would be embarrassing. Uh, so to get over this moment, he clears his throat and continues. I confess that I do think there is a disparity, which means difference. Too great a disparity and in a point no less essential than mine. So he thinks that if there is one possible problem with this marriage, it is that the minds of Benwick and Louisa may not match. He continues. I regard Louisa Musgrove as a very amiable, remember friendly, sweet tempered girl. And not deficient in understanding. Not deficient, which means not lacking. So does she have a good understanding? Maybe not, but she has some understanding. So it's like she's not uh, in totally stupid, even if she's not very wise. So somewhere in the middle, acceptable level of understanding. But Benwick is something more. Hmm. So remember up to this point, everyone thought that Wentworth was going to marry Louisa. But here he's saying maybe Louisa's marriage to Benwick may, if there is one thing that would uh, keep them from being happy, it is that Louisa is not on the same level as Benwick. She is on a lower level. So from this, Anne realizes that Wentworth doesn't love Louisa. You would never say that about someone you love. Uh, and this is Anne's reaction, same page. She had distinguished every word, so despite the noise, she heard everything that he said, was struck, which means it took her by surprise, gratified, so like she agrees, confused, because she think she thought that uh, Wentworth loved Louisa and beginning to breathe very quick and feel a hundred things in a moment. Uh, this is an incredible piece of writing because it doesn't say Anne suddenly realized what he was saying. It doesn't say Anne suddenly realized that he was never going to marry Louisa. It tells us what she realizes by describing her physical reaction. Um, so sometimes you will hear you will hear people say that it is in fiction it is better to show and not tell. So when something happens, it is better to show how the characters react, to show the effect of what happens, rather than to tell the reader what happens and to tell the reader how people think about what happens. To show, not tell. Now, I don't think this is always correct. There are many stories that I love that tell instead of show. But here, this is the a classic example of showing and not telling. Up to this point, nobody has said anything uh, about Wentworth's uh, decision or not decision to marry Louisa. But from the evidence that the story gives us, we realize that it's impossible that he wanted to marry Louisa if he thinks that she is not as good as Benwick. 
Uh, and from Anne's reaction, we realize that Anne also understands this. And the novel tells us all of this without telling us that this is what's actually going on. It lets the reader discover the actual meaning the same way that Anne discovers the actual meaning by noticing what Wentworth says. It's putting us in the same place as Anne. We're learning the actual situation together. And so the effect of this design is that when Anne is struck, gratified, confused, beginning to breathe very quick and feeling a hundred things in a moment. The reader is also feeling this. First, they're struck by how strange it is that Wentworth would say something bad about Louisa. Then they think and they realize, no, no, he's correct. Louisa is that kind of person, yeah. Then they're confused because, wait, this is Wentworth talking. Wasn't he in love? Why would he say this? And then suddenly we realize, oh, he was never in love with her at all. And then that gets us excited uh, because the next moment we realize if Wentworth is not taken and Anne is still single, then it's still possible that these two will end up together. And because from the very beginning of the novel, we have been expecting this. It gives us a feeling that what we have been expecting for 20 chapters is finally about to happen. And that makes us very excited. For us, it's only been 20 chapters, like four weeks, five weeks, maybe. For Anne, it has been nine years. And maybe an extra year or like uh, maybe eight of those years don't count because they were separated. But for the last year, uh, Captain Wentworth has returned to her social circle. So it's been like half a year of waiting and confusion and nervousness. And finally here she has a very likely answer. Maybe they will end up together. Uh, but of course she's being polite. So she can't say any of this. She it was impossible for her to enter on such a subject. Uh, she can't join the conversation about this because she is so emotional right now. Uh, but she feels the necessity of speaking. Wentworth has finished speaking, so the polite thing is to join the conversation. And so she decides to join the conversation by, first of all, she does not want to change the subject. Right. Finally, after nine years, she's about to have confirmation that her love still loves her. Who would want to change the subject? Um, so she doesn't want to change the topic, but at the same time, she can't actually talk about this uh, without losing her head. So she, the way that she resumes the conversation is to ask about something. Similar or related. Deviate means to change direction. So she only changed direction enough to say. You were a good while at Lyme, I think. This is also a perfectly chosen question by Jane Austen. It's related to the topic of Benwick and Louisa and Wentworth. But it's not the same topic. Also, it's asking about something that Anne already knows. She knows that he was there for a while. This, so this question, remember, she is incredibly emotional right now. She doesn't have the brain power to, to carry on a full and lively conversation. So this question is the question that takes the least amount of brain power because she already knows the answer. She doesn't have to pay attention or pay so much attention. Uh, so they keep talking and her next sentence is very similar. I should, this is page 122. I should very much like to see Lyme again, said Anne. Again, very, very low brain power statement. 
She's not commenting on what he Wentworth has just said. She is not commenting on any people at all. She's just talking about a place and herself. And it's the simplest emotion. I want to go again. I want to return again. Now, if she were really using her brain, she would realize that this is the same as saying that even though Louisa had her accident there, even though there are painful memories there, I still want to go again. Which doesn't make sense. Especially because the event has happened not too long ago. It's still fresh in her mind. So the fact that she says this tells you that she's not using her brain power. She's still too emotionally disturbed and excited to fully participate in the conversation. Um, and then they keep talking. And then uh, Wentworth uh, breaks off, I believe. Right, they were divided. Uh, and then the scene continues, but then on page 123, uh, we finally, finally get into Anne's mind. The novel has been showing us and showing us, and finally it starts to tell us. Uh, so this is a big scene, right? Lady Dalrymple and Miss Carteret have arrived. Everybody is trying to get their attention. Conversations are happening all over the place. But Anne saw nothing, thought nothing of the brilliance of the room. Her happiness was from within. Her eyes were bright and her cheeks glowed, but she knew nothing about it. She was thinking only of the last half hour, and as they passed to their seats, uh, I think they're finally going entering the concert hall. As they finally sit down, her mind took a hasty range over it, which means she looked back over the last half hour in her mind. She replayed it. Uh, of course, at the time they didn't have like CDs or tapes uh, or video, so we didn't have the word replay. But that's what she's doing. She's replaying the last half hour in her mind. His choice of subjects, his expressions, and still more his manner and look had been such as she could see in only one light, which means there was only one meaning, only po one possible interpretation. His opinion of Louisa Musgrove's inferiority uh, his half averted eyes, so he's not completely able to look Anne in the eye. All, all declared that he had a heart returning to her at, la at least. Uh, so maybe he doesn't still love her, but at least he's turning back toward her. That anger, resentment, avoidance were no more. He's no longer angry that she broke off their engagement. And that they were succeeded. These emotions, right? Anger, resentment, avoidance were succeeded, uh, which means followed. Not merely by friendship and regard. Regard here means like politeness. Being polite, being willing to, to in interact with someone. So it's not just friendship and regard but by the tenderness of the past. Yes, some share of the tenderness of the past. This tells us that Anne realizes maybe she's going a bit too far. Maybe she's being too uh, caught up in her emotions. So maybe not a complete tenderness of the past, maybe some part of the tenderness of the past. So not all of it, maybe just some of it. She could not contemplate the change as implying less. He must love her. Right, so that answers the question. Uh, that's the evidence. And of course we agree because it makes sense. 
But there's also another reason that you will not find in the book for why this interpretation makes sense. And that is because Think of all of, of the characters that we have met so far. Of all the either upper class people or rich people that we have met so far, especially men, upper class and rich men. How many are still single? Only Mr. Elliot and Captain Wentworth. And between these two, who does Anne like more? Captain Wentworth. Therefore, not just by the evidence of the characters, but by the structure of the story, we also agree that Wentworth still loves Anne. Uh, of the single upper class women, the only other one is Elizabeth, and nobody loves Elizabeth, so it must be Anne by design of the story. Let's take a short break. And if you have questions, now is a good time to ask. Sorry, I was away from my desk. Did someone ask a question? Oh yeah, 老师,等一下你可以再说一次,就是书中没有提到那个Anne还是喜欢Wentworth的理由吗? 什么什么的理由？你不是就是刚最后一题，你说就是书中小说里面没有提到，是因为 there are there are only two single men. 哦，我等一下会再讲。对对对，我还没有，我我没有查完，谢谢。OK OK。
OK, let's continue. Um, so I was just saying that. Um, Captain Wentworth must still love Anne. Not only from evidence of what he says and what he does, but also by the design of the novel. Here's the thing. Logically speaking, just because Wentworth does not love Louisa does not necessarily mean that he still loves Anne. And his behavior might simply be because he was embarrassed and nervous. He may know many single women that are not presented in the novel. We only see what Anne sees. So if Anne doesn't see the other women that he knows, uh, then maybe he knows many women. We don't know. But the design of the novel tells us that they will end up together. Here's why. Uh, in this society, only single people of the same social class or similar social class can end up with each other. So for the men, you have Mr. Elliot and Captain Wentworth. These are the only two men who are still single. On the side of the women, you have Anne and Elizabeth. Uh, and also Mrs. Clay, but like Mrs. Clay, nobody's she's a different social class. Uh, and we also know that nobody really likes Elizabeth. Uh, so both Mr. Elliot and Captain Wentworth, therefore, must if they end up with some woman, they must end up with Anne. It's like a mix and match. Um, this kind of logic is actually built into the idea of a romantic comedy. In Shakespeare's day, the word comedy used to mean a play that ends in marriage. So by the end of the play, all the good people have gotten married. Uh, and only the bad people are still single. That is the definition of a comedy play in Shakespeare's time. So the logic is already built into the play. If you walk into the play knowing that it's a comedy and you see that there are still like some single men and some single women and they're all pretty good people, then you immediately know that they will get married to each other by the end of the play. Now, this logic is quite different from what we today would think of as a good romance story. Today we would call this kind of story structure overdetermined. Which means that there is more uh, reasons for people to end up together than is logical. So like in life, we we assume that people end up together because they like each other and like the time is right and the moment is right. We usually don't think that people end up with each other because they don't know anybody else. Um, but that's basically what a, a classical comedy or this novel is saying. They will end up together because there's nobody else that is suitable. So today when we watch like a romantic comedy movie, uh, that may seem to be kind of uh, overdetermined. Like the lead man and the lead woman only end up together because they are the lead man and the lead woman. Uh, there is no other lead man, there is no other lead woman, so they have to end up together. Uh, even if the actors obviously don't like each other, or even if they they obviously have no romantic attraction to each other. If the story says these two have to end up together, boom, they end up together. A lot of romantic comedies work like this. Uh, romantic movies uh, work like this today. Um, so that's the reason why one of my favorite uh, romantic movies is um, it's a movie called Unrelated by the British director 
Joanna Hogg. Uh, and it's not a comedy. It's sad. It has a sad ending. Maybe I shouldn't have told you that. No, no, no. You, it's pretty obvious from the beginning that it's a sad ending. Um, but the way that the romance is developed is not by presenting us with a man and a woman. Uh, it's by giving us a woman entering into a group of friends. So like from the beginning, she could have ended up with anyone. But slowly, as we observe these people interacting together, uh, it becomes slowly obvious which man is interested in her and which man she is interested in. Um, so we actually do get a sense of two people who like each other. By the way, this movie is the first movie starring Thomas Hiddleston. Uh, Tom Hiddleston, uh, Loki former boyfriend of Taylor Swift. This is his first movie and he does a really good job in it. Why am I talking about this? Oh yes, so that's the uh, question five. That's another reason why Captain Wentworth must still love her because he has no other suitable uh, wife candidate in the novel. It has to be her. OK, so those are the five questions. Do you want to ask me anything? Any questions? Sometimes I worry that not everyone is there. OK, uh, so let's go back to the beginning of this week's reading. Um, hmm. Laura Place, I believe this is where uh, Lady Dalrymple is staying, right? I can't remember. Yes, that's where Lady Dalrymple and, and uh, Miss Carteret are staying. So while uh, Sir Walter and Elizabeth were assiduously Remember, this means like with great effort. Pushing their good fortune in Laura Place, trying to renew the acquaintance and the relation with this very important woman, Lady Dalrymple. Anne was renewing an acquaintance of a very different description. She had called on her former governess. A governess is like a, a tutor for young kids. Uh, often uh, she is not only in charge of teaching the kids, but also of helping to take care of the kids. And uh, sometimes the governess will live in the same house as the kid. So like. Uh, the Sound of Music, Sensanmei, that movie, uh, the, the leading woman is a governess. That's how she enters the house. And that's why she has to teach the kids music. Uh, so Anne had called on, call on means visit. She had visited her former governess and had heard from her of there being an old schoolfellow in Bath. Schoolfellow, of course, means a schoolmate, someone who went to the same school, who had the two strong claims on her attention of past kindness and present suffering. So to have a claim on her attention means a good reason she should visit this friend. Uh, and these two reasons, first of all, uh, she used to be kind to Anne. And secondly, uh, she is currently suffering. So for both reasons, Anne should go visit her. Miss Hamilton, now Mrs. Smith, so before she was married, she was known and her, her family name was Hamilton. Then she got married to a Mr. Smith. Uh, had shown her kindness in one of those periods of her life when it had been most valuable. Anne had gone unhappy to school, grieving for the loss of a mother whom she had dearly loved. So Anne had been sent to school 
uh, soon after Lady Elliot died, so she was still grieving her mother. She was feeling her separation from home uh, because at the time good schools were boarding schools. You lived away from home. This is even before college. This is like uh, what we would call like junior high. And she was suffering as a girl of 14 of strong sensibility, which means uh, her emotions were very uh, sensitive. And not high spirits, which means she was not always happy and cheerful. Must suffer at such a time. So because of her circumstances and her personality, she was quite unhappy th at that time. And Miss Hamilton, three years older than herself, so she, Miss Hamilton at the time was 17, but still from her want of near relations and a settled home remaining another year at school, so even though she's already 17, she's remaining another year at school because of her want, which means lack, her lack of near relations, so she doesn't have close family, like maybe her parents both died or something like that. She also lacks a settled home. Uh, so here that means like owning your own house and having your own land. Here apparently, uh, first of all, this could mean two things. One, like the house is not hers, so she might have to, or her family might have to move once in a while, so it's not a settled home. The other possibility is that because she has no close family, uh, she doesn't have, so she has like more distant family, more distant relatives, and maybe she has more than one uh, set of relatives, more than one family that she could join, but they are all equally distant. There is no one that is closer than the other, and therefore not not one of their places is where she could call home. Uh, there, because remember, this is based on social relations. You're supposed to stay with the family that you are closest to. So if there are like two or three families that are equally close or like not close, then uh, social custom and politeness means that you would have to move between their houses throughout the year. And so she does not have a settled home. And therefore decides to stay at school another year. Uh, so she had been useful and good to her, to Anne, in a way which had considerably lessened her misery and could never be remembered with indifference. Uh, so good memories of Miss Hamilton. Uh, Anne feels very grateful to her. Miss Hamilton had left school, had married not long afterwards, was said to have married a man of fortune, and this was all that Anne had known of her till now that their governess's account brought her situation forward in a more decided but very different form. So she has learned more substantial and concrete information about this Mrs. Smith, but it is very different from what she from what Anne used to know about her. 101. She was a widow and poor. Her husband had been extravagant, which means he spent a lot of money. And at his death, about two years before, had left his affairs dreadfully involved. Involved here means entangled, Zhou Chan. Uh, tied up with many different people and many different things. Now, if uh, someone has died, usually that means that they can't uh, be, they can't continue to be involved in, in different kinds of business because they're dead. The only kind of business that continues after someone dies is debt. Qian Um, um so, so 
that is the affairs and the business that Mrs. Smith has to deal with. Lots of debt. She had had difficulties of every sort to contend with. Someone's microphone is on. Hang on. OK, so she had difficulties of every sort to contend with. And in addition to these distresses, difficulties had been afflicted with a severe rheumatic fever. So she is also sick. A rheumatism is what we today would call arthritis. Uh, fever which finally settling in her legs had made her for the present a cripple. Uh, so if the rheumatism is settling in her legs, that means that it is very painful for her to walk. Uh, cripple. Today we don't use this word. Today we say that someone is disabled or has a disability. Uh, a slightly older word, which we also don't use. OK, uh, another word which is just a little bit older than disabled is one word that we no longer use is handicapped. Uh, if you look, if you read things from like the late 1990s, early 2000s, handicapped was the word, but today we don't use that word. We use disabled. Um, I can go into a short history of these terms. Um, handicapped used to be the polite word um, because it's a euphemism, weiwansi. A handicap uh, comes from horse racing. When a horse is too fast, uh, and we know that the horse is too fast, in order to make the race more fair, uh, the they would add weight like sandbags on top of the horse. Like so, uh, you know how you would lay like a blanket over a horse's back. It's the same thing, but on both sides of the blanket there would be sandbags, so it would be heavier, and the horse would slow down. That's a handicap, something that makes uh, that makes it harder for someone to do something. In golf, the word handicap means um, again for a player that is too good in order to make the competition more fair. Um, do you guys know how to play golf? Do you know the rules of golf? Uh, so basically golf, the goal in golf is to get the ball into the hole with as few a number of swings as possible. So the best possible score is a hole in one because you only swing once. If you swing twice, uh, you, you have you have one point taken away. If you swing three times, you have two points taken away, that kind of thing. Um, now each golf course I mean, you, you can't expect everyone to get a hole in one, right? That's it's very unlikely. So each golf course has a number of uh, acceptable swings. So if you swing fewer times than the number, you, you get you get points added. Uh, but if you swing more times than the number, you get points taken away. Now a handicap is when a very good player uh, is required to use fewer swings on a course. So let's say this course or this hole, uh, each course has like 18 holes. So this hole, let's say the par or the number of swings is uh, five. A very good player might have a handicap of one, which means they have to do it in four swings, or they could have a handicap of two which means they have to get the ball in using three swings. So that's handicap in golf. Uh, the idea is the same, something that makes it harder for someone to do something. Now, the reason why this is no longer the, the polite word to use is because in the United States, when disabled people uh, were fighting for like equal rights and like protection, 
and to have like buildings with ex accessibility, you know, to have the government uh, help them to live their lives easier. Uh, the government came up with laws that didn't really work very well. And the reason they didn't work very well is because the government didn't really talk with uh, disabled people and disabled activists. They kind of made laws uh, based on like what they think disabled people need. Uh, so the word handicapped got attached to those laws, got connected to those laws. And because the laws didn't really work very well, disabled people realized that they needed to keep fighting so that their actual needs uh, would be heard by the government. So they had to change uh, the word that they used to describe themselves. If uh, you called yourself handicapped, you're sort of putting yourself with the these new laws that don't really work and with the process of coming up with these laws that did not include actual disabled people. But if you call yourself disabled, even though this word looks like it's less polite, right? It's the opposite of able. You are not able to do something. So it looks it less polite, but because this is the word that disabled people themselves chose, uh, calling people disabled uh, shows that you understand the need to listen to disabled people when they talk about what they need help with and how the government could help them. So uh, that's why we don't use handicapped and that's why we don't use cripple. Uh, today the word cripple um, simply means to make it harder to do something. Uh, and the the use of cripple to mean a disabled person is no longer considered polite. So anyways, Mrs. Smith has arthritis in her legs. She it's very hard for her to walk. Um, she had come to Bath on that account. Because Bath is uh, rumored to have. Why is it called Bath? Because uh, that city has, I think it was like hot springs or like uh, pool water uh, that is said to be healing. It's said to be medicine. So like uh, today we say like, oh, if you have a sore, I don't know, sore body, you can go to the hot springs and it will improve your pain or something, something similar. And so that's why um, Mrs. Smith is at Bath because apparently uh, the water at Bath can help her improve her arthritis. Uh, and she was now in lodgings near the hot baths. Living in a very humble way. So in lodgings, of course, again, means not her own place. She's renting it. She's living in a very humble way because she's poor. Unable even to afford herself the comfort of a servant. So she's so poor that she can't even afford a servant. I mean, today we would think like, oh, that's. No, I mean, that's not that poor. That's OK, but uh, you should remember that at the time, especially for upper class people, um, they lived in such big houses. They had so much land. It's impossible to maintain a place like that without servants. Um, so Mrs. Smith used to be wealthy, used to have a home, so she used to have lots of servants. Now she can't even afford one when she actually needs it for herself. Uh, and of course, because of her situation, she is almost excluded from society. She is still part of society with the barest minimum connections. And we know that that connection is through her nurse, Nurse Rook. If it were not for Nurse Rook, she would be completely excluded from society. Uh, so here society doesn't mean so like today we say in society, like meaning like in the place where we live along with these other people. Society at the time used to mean social relations, social functions, social events, meeting people. 
Uh, so you can see the root of the word, right? Society, social, it's the same root. Um, so when it says that Mrs. Smith was almost excluded from society, it doesn't mean that the entire society was ignoring her. It means that she finds it very, very hard and rare to meet and talk with other people. Uh, so as we said, her only link to society now is through Nurse Rook. And uh, now with Anne. Anne has re-entered her life. Their mutual friend, so this is the friend between that Anne and Mrs. Smith share. So this must be uh, her old governess answered for the satisfaction which a visit from Miss Elliot would give Mrs. Smith. So here it's saying uh, when Anne sent someone to ask, or I guess when she herself asked her governess, oh, would Mrs. Smith like me to visit? Uh, her governess said that this would uh, give Mrs. Smith much satisfaction. So yes, she would be happy to be visited. And Anne therefore lost no time in going. She mentioned nothing of what she had heard or what she intended at home. It would excite no proper interest there. Excite here means uh, create or attract or evoke. Uh, no proper interest, so nobody would care. If she told like her father or Elizabeth that she was going to visit this old friend, they wouldn't care. So she decides not to talk about it. She only consulted Lady Russell, who entered thoroughly into her sentiments, uh, which means she had the same feelings as Anne. Uh, the word into. Is still used today, but not very formal. Like the singer Drake Drake once saying that he was in his feelings, uh, which means that he was feeling something like emotional, um, but it's not used very common today. So Lady Russell agrees with Anne and was most happy to convey her as near to Mrs. Smith's lodgings in Westgate buildings as Anne chose to be taken. So remember Anne if Anne doesn't tell her family, then she can't borrow her family's carriage. So if she doesn't want to walk across the entire city of Bath, she needs to find someone who would be willing to lend her her carriage or to take her. And that someone is Lady Russell. Um, uh, and so Lady Russell would take her as close to Westgate building as, as Anne chose to be taken. Now, notice that Lady Russell does not take her all the way to Westgate buildings. Anne chooses not take, to take the carriage all the way. Why? Well, because, you know, Mrs. Smith is poor, right? Um, she used to be rich. She used to have her own carriage, probably more than one carriage, but now she's poor. And she can't move. So imagine how she would feel if every time Anne came to visit, she rode in this great carriage that stopped right in front of her door. Maybe she would feel jealous. Maybe she would feel like Anne is uh, going to so much trouble using so many resources for herself, uh, for Mrs. Smith herself. Maybe she doesn't feel worth and taking so much trouble. Um, it would not make Mrs. Smith feel good. In other words, it would not make her feel happy. And so here we see how considerate Anne is, how kind she is. Yes, Mrs. Smith knows that Anne is currently richer than she is. Yes, we know that Anne has a better situation than she does. 
but Anne tries her best not to remind her to try to uh, not make it so obvious, and that is a kind of kindness. So like Lady Russell would take her somewhere near Westgate buildings, and then Anne would get off and walk the rest of the way. And makes her seem more equal. Which is what she wants because she's making a friend. So she goes, the visit was paid, which means she went. Their acquaintance reestablished their interest in each other more than rekindled. So they're very interested in getting to know each other. This is not a gay book, so it's not a romance. It's a good friendship. The first 10 minutes of the visit had its awkwardness and its emotion. 12 years were gone since they had parted and each presented a somewhat different person from what the other had imagined. 12 years had changed Anne from the blooming, silent, unformed girl of 15. So blooming, so she's slowly become gradually becoming beautiful which means she was not yet beautiful. She was becoming beautiful. Uh, and that's why we also have the word unformed. Uh, her, her features, her figure, her person were still growing and changing and developing. She had not yet reached her mature form. So that was 12 years ago. Now she is the elegant little woman of seven and 20, uh, which means she's now 27 years old. With every beauty accepting bloom. So she's beautiful. The only kind of beauty she does not have is the kind of beauty where someone is only gradually now becoming beautiful. There is a kind of beauty that describes how beautiful someone will become. It's like a potential kind of beauty. You can see that they will grow up to become beautiful, and that itself is a kind of beauty. So this is the only kind of beauty that Anne currently does not have. She also, Anne, has manners as consciously right as they were invariably gentle. So her manners are not only good manners, they are carefully good manners. She's not just accidentally good mannered. She works very hard to be good mannered. Uh, and she's gentle and invariably means constantly, always, no exception. She's always gentle. And. And 12 years had transformed the fine looking, well grown Miss Hamilton in all the glow of health and confidence of superiority into a poor, infirm, which means sick, helpless widow, receiving the visit of her former protege as a favor. A protege is a student, but not like a formal student. Like I would not call you my protege. You're just my students. Um, today, instead of protege, a more common word that we use is mentee. And this is because uh, the teacher of a protege or a mentee is a mentor, a mentor. So today we might call this like Jing San Dao Si, like someone who teaches you about um, things you don't learn in school and not through a formal teacher student relationship, but like simply as taking someone uh, and help guiding them, helping them informally. So that's what uh, protege means. It's French. Uh, it's French, so the G is pronounced J. Protege. Protege. And it's her former protege. Um, so she's receiving the visit as a favor. She knows that she is. Uh, Miss Hamilton, Mrs. Smith knows that she is of lower social standing, knows that she can give little to Anne to make her visit worthwhile. So 
she can only take Anne's visit as a favor. Remember last week we were talking about Anne making charity visits to the village. This is the same thing. But all that was uncomfortable in the meeting had soon passed away and left only the interesting charm of remembering former partialities and talking over old times. Partiality mean here is something that one likes. Uh, so this comes from the verb phrase to be partial to something. To be partial to something means to like something. So partiality is something that you like. Former partiality, therefore, is things or people that you used to like. And this is talking about their adolescence, their young adulthood. So at first, uh, because their social situation is so different, the meeting began very awkwardly, but soon they were reunited and crossed over the awkwardness because of their shared memories of school. Uh, OK, and then describing Mrs. Smith. Hang on, let me yawn. OK, describing Mrs. Smith and found in Mrs. Smith. Uh, the good sense is thank you for joining me in the yawn. Uh, Anne found in Mrs. Smith the good sense and agreeable manners which she had almost ventured to depend on. Uh, so here I think what she's saying is that Mrs. Smith's good sense and agreeable manners were the same as they used to be when they were teenagers. Uh, so when Anne says she had almost ventured to depend on them, it, to depend on here means to count on, which means to predict. Right? If you count on someone, that means you know that they will be there for you. So to count on something means that to, you know that they these things will be there. Uh, in other words, you can predict that they will be there. So she had almost predicted, uh, she had almost wanted or tried to uh, predict that Mrs. Smith had still had good sense and good manners. But it's been such a long time, she can't be sure. So it's almost ventured to depend on. She's not, Anne wasn't sure at first, but now she is sure. She found these still there. Uh, so good sense, agreeable manners, and a disposition, which means temper, Beijing, to converse and be cheerful beyond her expectation, beyond Anne's expectation. So even though Mrs. Smith is in a terrible situation, she still uh, has a tendency and personality to chat and be cheerful. Neither the dissipations of the past, dissipation here means like uh, bad things and like loss of good fortune. And she had lived very much in the world, which means that she had suffered along with the world. Uh, when we say in the world, uh, sorry, when the novel says in the world, it is of course opposed to outside the world. So what is outside the world? Maybe heaven or like the church? being a priest, that kind of thing. Um, so being in the world means to to go through things that everyone goes through to suffer as people suffer. Uh, if we view religion and heaven, I should say Christian religion and heaven as something eternal, unchanging. Once you enter heaven, you're set for the rest of eternity. Nothing bad will happen to you. Uh, so the opposite being in the world means that bad things will happen to you. Bad things happen to everybody. Um, so that's what that means. She had uh, Mrs. Smith had suffered dissipations, which shows that she had lived very much in the world. 
So neither these dissipations nor the restrictions of the present. She can't move. She has no money. Neither sickness nor sorrow seem to have closed her heart or ruined her spirits. In the course of a second visit, uh, Mrs. Smith talked with great openness and Anne's astonishment increased. She could scarcely imagine a more cheerless situation in itself than Mrs. Smith's. True, it's hard to imagine a situation worse than this. She had been very fond of her husband. She had buried him. She had been used to affluence, so she had been used to being wealthy. She was it was a habit of being wealthy. It was gone. She had no child to connect with her life with. Sorry, she had no child to connect her with life and happiness again. So remember when we talked about Lady Elliot, we said uh, the novel says that she still found enough of interest in her children and her family to regret dying. Like there's still something connecting her to life. Uh, her children and family here. Mrs. Smith had no child to connect her with life and happiness. No relations, which means family to assist in the arrangement of perplexed affairs. So affairs means business. Perplexed today means confused. And I guess you could still you in this sense, you could still describe it as confused when a business is confused. It means that it's, there's no clear way to resolve the business. So usually we say a person is confused, but you can also describe business or affairs or a situation as confused. So it's complicated, entangled, hard to resolve. Uh, no family to help her with this. No health to make all the rest supportable. Um, so the, it's saying if she had been healthy, maybe she could have slowly taken care of all of these other problems, but she doesn't have good health. And again, remember in the first week we talked about how this society understands health, and we said that it's related to look uh, good appearance and good social standing and social situation. Here it's the same thing. As long as she is healthy, she can work to improve her social situation. It's still connected. Her accommodations, the place where she's living, were limited to a noisy parlor. A parlor, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this, a noisy parlor and a dark bedroom behind. So it's a two bedroom place. She used to be wealthy. She used to have her own house. Now she lives in a place with only two rooms. Uh, so do you remember we talked about the drawing room? Uh, I think it was uh, at Upper Cross. The Musgroves had a house with a drawing room, and I told you it's not a place to draw. It's a place to welcome guests, to draw the guests into the house. Now, uh, if your house is big enough, you would have a drawing room to welcome guests, and then once everybody is here, you would take them into the parlor. A parlor is a place to talk. It comes from the French, parler, which means to talk. Parler, parler, French. Uh, so it's a it's a place for social gatherings, and then. Uh, you would talk until like lunch or dinner is ready because it's being prepared by your servants and you would enter the dining room to eat. And then after eating, you would go back to the parlor and enjoy some coffee. And maybe the men would go to the smoking room to smoke and chat. Uh, and in order to go to the smoking room, they would also have to change their jacket. Uh, I don't know if I told you this. No, that was a different class. OK, so it used to be that it was impolite to take off your suit jacket if you were a man. Everybody wore a suit jacket to do anything. 
That's why when today you go to buy a suit jacket, uh, some will be called shoshin xi zhuang, recreational or like light. The English word is a uh, blazer. These are worn for informal occasions because you are supposed to wear a suit jacket for any occasion. Even if you were like working in your garden or like getting exercise, you would have to wear a sports jacket. That's it's also a kind of uh, suit jacket, a sport jacket. Now I talk about this because if you enter the smoking room, you have to change your jacket into a smoking jacket. Uh, like today, we know about third hand smoke, sensor yin. First hand smoke is when you smoke. Second hand smoke is when someone smells you smoking. Third hand smoke is when you smoke and you leave the room and someone smells the smoke on the things in the room. Uh, and this has also been proven to be carcinogenic. Uh, so third hand smoke also causes cancer. Uh, somebody should really tell the bus drivers of Taipei. Uh, but anyway, so people back then, to be polite, would try to avoid the smell by changing into a special jacket in order to enter a special room where the men can enjoy smoking and talking together. Uh, and it's not just about smoking, right? It's about a uh, conversation between men and men only. It's kind of like how uh, women use the like girls' restroom today, right? Um, not just to use the restroom, but also as a kind of social place to to have a conversation strictly between women. Uh, but this is for men. So that's the parlor. Uh, and there are only two rooms, but because she has arthritis in her legs, there's no possibility of moving from one to the other without assistance. And there was only one servant in the entire house. So she's not living in her own house. She's sharing a house with many different people. Uh, and all of them share one servant. Uh, and she never quitted the house, which means leave the house. She never quitted the house. Except but means except to be conveyed into the warm bath. The medi medical bath of bath. To be conveyed into means to be carried into, to be sent into. Uh, and the bottom of the page tells us the supposedly medicinal waters for which bath was famous. Healing water, a uh, hot bath, like a hot spring. Uh, so this is telling us she her place only has two rooms. She shares a servant with everybody else in the house. She can't move. And the only time that she is moved is to to go into the medical bath. So in other words, she's either in bed or in the water. One of these two. Uh, even in this poor situation, she still finds a good cheer and conversation whenever she can find it in her poor life. What a person. OK, let's stop here. Do you have questions? No. Nope. OK, great. Uh, class dismissed. See you next week.